So hello there guys and welcome to Eva's Fly Workshop. What's what's up guys? I want to wish you all guys uh, happy holidays to all of you. I want to welcome you to this online presentation. It's uh, the second one we are making uh, that we are promoting like a fishing spot. And uh, who knows if you are going to make even more in some video logs and some fishing trips you are doing and some stuff like like that. Uh, in this video we are going to travel a little bit and have a look at one of my favorite destinations that I go fly fishing in Iceland. But this spot has become known as the uh, known very well known for its uh, chances to catch the Arctic char. I love the place and the nature there and the coldness and everything about it. It's really calm. Uh, this video is produced by myself but uh, with a little support from uh, Vedi Kortil which is the fishing cart right here. Uh, Vedi Kortil is like a system that you can buy a cart and you can get access to it's about 35 or 36 lakes in all over Iceland and it's for non-residents uh, as well. Um, I get like a uh, little support from my tackling store Flugubulan in Iceland and you will be assisted there by Joey to ha help you to pick the right gear when you come to Iceland for fishing and in any case of questions you can always drop me an email at uh, fluesman at gmail.com I, uh, I will place an email in the description of the video or you can write a comment as well I'll try to read and reply all of them of course uh, before we carry on it's right to mention that uh, you can if you want to uh, support my work I've been putting on uh, this a lo lots of uh, work into the channel and you can support the channel if you like by visiting this site here buymeacoffee.com slash fluidsmedium uh, fluidsmedium is uh, the Icelandic name for the channel and you can buy me a cup of coffee there if you, if you like and uh, it's just a opportunity for you to say like a like a uh, decent thank you for all the work I've been putting into the videos and into the channel but uh, we will continue to release uh, two videos a week all the winter long all the season all the tying season and uh, and we'll do some, be doing some, yeah, some games and some fun stuff as well. Even though we have this uh, option for for donating the channel, the uh, videos are going to be free, of course. On oh, it's just an opportunity for you guys. Uh, full steam ahead to the next slide. We are traveling over over from the place where I live. That is right about here in Bildalur, up to this hill. It uh, has a beautiful view over Arnafjörður. And we are heading over the Breiðafjörður Bay to Hrensfjörður. Hrensfjörður is a place we are going to learn about in this uh, online lecture. And we take the ferry over the over the Breiðafjörður Bay and uh, visit Rensfjörður. Rensfjörður is a matter of maybe 15 minutes drive away from Stikisólmur on the northern side of the Snæfjörðsnes Peninsula. A bit about myself, uh, my name is Ivar Arthaksson. I've been uh, fishing and hunting for over 30 years. I a master's in law in 2019. I'm a father of two, two, two boys and uh, I run this uh, YouTube channel, Ivar's Fly Workshop. And uh, it's correct to mention that uh, these slides we are having a look at here about the biology and the ecosystem in the lake, they, they are just based on my experience as an angler. Uh, I'm not a scientist or, or a professional about the nature, not at all. But where is Hrensfjörður located? I'll tell you guys, it's right here on the northern, northern side of this huge peninsula that goes here which is called Snæfjöld's Ness. It's really pretty. You can do that as a day tour from Reykjavik if you visit Iceland. It's right here, we can zoom in and Hrensfjörður, the lagoon or the lake we are having a look at, that's right here where we are, uh, where I'm pointing the mouse. 
it's on the northern side, side of uh, Snuggles as it takes you about yeah two hours from Reykjavik to drive and it's located right between Grundarfjörður, that is a fishing village, and Stikkisormur, it's another fishing village. It's kind of between the two of those. And the destination from Reykjavik is about 180 kilometers or 110 miles. Miles and there's, uh, there are plenty of stops on the way to pick up something to eat or fuel up or whatever you need to pick up. Uh, here you can see the way marked on the map all the way to uh, to uh, Rensjörg. It is possible to camp by the lagoon but there is also accommodation to be found in the area by some local farmers or or uh, guest house or hotels in Stikinsholmur or Grundafjörður. It's also possible to camp by the lake or in the lava field, uh, the Berserke Rhen lava field. That's, uh, that's an experience. It's a really cool spot to camp there and you can be absolutely on your own. Uh, this map I got from something called Apple Maps. I just realized that I had access to it since I'm using an using an Apple product. But they have really good uh, aerial uh, maps and photos, so uh, they're using them. Uh, the lake is that large, or the lagoon, it's like a title, partly, so there's like a sea water that comes into it, or the dam sometimes, and, and the uh, water level varies because of that. Uh, we have to split it up in parts and uh, speak about its part in a row. You cannot do the lake just like this from above. Uh, you'll have a closer look at that later in, the, in this presentation. Access to the lagoon. Here's the garden and the, and the beginning of it. Uh, the access to it is that you drive road 54 and this uh, way here will lead you to Grundarfjörður. The opposite direction will lead you to Stigsholmur and the way we came from. And you can do like a left turn into this road, which is uh, 558. And you can go like around here. It is gravel, you have to pay attention to that. And a normal car can do it, it's no problem. But when you're going in here, where I'm hunting a mouse here, I would suggest an SUV. It all depends on kind of the condition of the road. But I took my Toyota a few times here and it's not the best car for it, it's a bit too low. Uh, yeah, this is not from the eruptions in, in uh, or around Transfjörður, but uh, Transfjörður, or, or lava, it basically means lava field. This picture I took from the uh, volcano when I hiked up there in May this year, the one that was active at that point in Iceland. But uh, we are having this picture here because um, we're going to do a little geology, have a little bit of a look at the geology. You can see all this here. This is a lava field called Berserkerhren. This is not large, this is only 14 square kilometers on the uh, in size, and that is uh, just like a stamp, or it's really small compared to some of the bigger lava fields we have in Iceland. They mainly, it mainly came from those two craters here, Rökula and Graukula. And it is about, yeah, 4,000 years back that it erupted. It is what we called apal lava or aa lava. So it's lumpy and rough, but at, at the same time, very beautiful. And there is like, you can see it slightly here. There is like a gravel road that takes you through the lava field. And that's when I was doing tour guiding. That was absolutely one of the favorites of uh, my customers. They loved it. Um, recommend that if you have time. It was, uh, yeah, you need like a <coughs> like a car. A normal car can do it. You have to drive just carefully and slowly. And it's like a lunar landscape over there. Absolutely. Uh, Berserkerhun is named because, uh, or the name of it is uh, because of two Swedish berserks. I don't know if those two are them. But you can uh, relate the name to um, to the uh, 
Icelandic sagas, uh, Heiðarvíða saga and Erbyrgja, Erbyrgja, both of those sagas mention this story about the berserks. And those two guys were hoaxed to pave a way through the lava field, which they did, but they were killed after finishing the job, which obviously was not a good deal for them. Uh, the way they paved is about 1200 meters long and the berserks, after they were killed, they were buried in a place which is called, uh, a spot which is called Berserkjalau or Dísjarlut. Never, never been there, but this is a picture from the lava I took by one of the student tour guiding. They have like those cairns marked through, through the way and it's like really pretty. Uh, non fishing related to flat tying related, but it's totally worth it if you visit Snavelkners to drive through the lava field. Absolutely, highly recommend it. Uh, yeah, let's get a bit closer to the uh, modern times here. Close to Hrunsfjörður, they have this uh, place here, Bjarnarhöp. That is like a shark museum. You can taste the fermented shark if you are yeah, brave enough, if you are brave enough to try and Believe me, the, the, that stuff will put hair on your chest if you try the shark. It's like so strong and smelly. But uh, I was going to tell you about as well on the uh, uh, about, about what happened in Hrunsvjörn before it got like came, became like a fishing spot. Uh, the, there was like a salmon farming inside the fjord, so you can see. What the, like one of the nets here and stuff. This tiny little dock still stands, and you can still see some remains from the uh, from the salmon farming. It's like a coastal salmon farming. So uh, they released juvenile salmon into the lagoon and opened the lagoon, so the juvenile salmon go in, go into the ocean and come back one or two years later. And that that's when they will be coming back. They will fence off the fjord and start to slaughter the fish. It was an adventure that was, did not work out at all, and we are going to go a little bit deeper into that. Uh, Rönsfjörður, like I said, yeah, about the salmon farming, became part of the coastal salmon farming adventure about 30 or 40 years back. A company named Silverlax, or in English, Silver Salmon, was established in 1984 and started the coastal salmon farming and built like this station transferred in 1986. In 1986 or 7. Uh, with about the same results as any other company that was in the same business uh, in Iceland at the same time. And uh, in the year 1990, it says here, they are releasing three million juvenile salmon into the into Rensjöru to increase the chance chance of uh, better harvesting. Uh, the first year the yields were yeah about seven percent, but a bit later on they went down to three percent, which is not acceptable. And uh, if you uh, and, and it went even further down, so uh, silver lux was operated at huge loss at the time. There was also uh, another fact uh, and another huge issue which we have on the news here, Stangbeðimenn Æðir og Vilja Stöðvin. That basically means anglers are furious about what's happening and uh, that, that uh, is because uh, the salmon that was slaughtered in the, in the fjord, that was not only salmon from the ones they released, it was also wild natural salmon that went with the stocked one, stocked fish, in here and was uh, killed. And at the same time uh, that critic was uh, fully valid because uh, still some farms in Iceland uh, still had permission to catch salmon in gill nets from their lands, if they had land uh, by the sea. And uh, a good day catch in the gill net farms were up to four hundred salmons just in one day, four hundred wild salmon. So, so you can imagine how uh, how and what kind of impact that had on the wild stock. And 
this light here, Threater Kanka, is like, I don't know what you call Threater Kanka, Walk of Shame or, yeah, something like that. In 1991, Silverlux uh, company uh, got like a 91 million kroner from the government, recalculated uh, today, that will be about 2.4 million dollars. And in 1994, the government allowed Silverlux to take a loan from the government in about for about 50 million kroners, and that is uh, recalculated into US dollars. That will be about 1.3 million US dollars. So that is just a huge amount of money they were, they were putting into this. Uh, that was not enough because. In the year 1995, Silverlux uh, declared bankruptcy, and at the point, the debts of uh, Silverlux was about 500 million Icelandic kroners. Uh, that would be about, if you recalculate it to modern uh, value, that would be about 11.5 million US dollars. And the loss, or the total loss of the Silver, Silverlux uh, company and the investors, was no more or less than 46 million US dollars. That is huge amounts of money that they lost in those few years they were running the company. And we are only, we are only speaking about silver lights. There were like so many companies trying to do the same business here in Iceland that all of them went bankrupt. And uh, while studying law, some of those uh, Judges, not Silverlux, but similar companies. Uh, some of, some of the issues went all the way to the Supreme Court. So that's, that's why I know this and why I'm showing this, guys. <coughs> showing this to you guys. Uh, so they they went bankrupt in uh, 1995. There are still, like I said, still some ruins. The dock still stands and, and stuff. There is some concrete uh, stuff here and nets and some stuff still left there but uh, but let's focus on the fishing in the lake and leave the historical facts behind uh, a loud bait in the uh, and lures and transfer is fly can fish here with uh, worms old wormy and and some spinners as well So, the fishing season starts at the 1st of April and uh, you can catch fish until the 13th of September. The fishing hours are from 7 p.m. to... Uh, sorry, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. It's uh, allowed to fish in the stream that runs into the lake. Around the dam you cannot fish. Uh, 100 meters away from each side from the dam, east or the west bank, you cannot fish. And below the dam is strictly forbidden fish. And of course, I do not have to mention that, but uh, driving off-road is against the law. And the good angler, like I always said, uh, leaves only his footprints left behind. And uh, transfer kind of need, uh, need a bit of, you know, caretaking. It's been over overrun by the salmon farming adventure, especially. But you can see here, here's a lava field we spoke about and there is like a path that you can walk through the lava field and down to the lake and those are really good spots here and we are going to speak about that just in a minute. Uh, it's fun to start fishing just right when the season starts in, in April as long as the ice is off the lake and you can actually get pretty good, pretty good catch uh, that early in the season, larger fish than uh, usually than later on. But uh, in general, Rensfjörður does not wake up until like the middle of May. You can get lucky earlier, but uh, it all varies on the on the season. Uh, there are no facilities by the lake, so there is no toilets or, or loo or, <laughs> or anything. So you have to be aware of that. And uh, the next uh, facilities are by by uh, in Stikusholmur or. Uh, Stikisomur or Gundafirur. Uh, if the 
Ah yes, it's off the lagoon the 1st of April, you can get lucky. And you can catch some decent fish there. The lake is rather cold even during the summertime. And the deepest part of the lake is, uh, I read, about 30 meters deep. It's quite deep. That means the sun, sun never gets to warm it up properly. Uh, Rinsfjord can be a demanding fishing spot, all, all of the lake. Uh, some parts of them are usually almost always lifeless, there's no fish or anything to be seen there, but uh, some, some other parts always have some life. Uh, also, one thing that you have to look at, the wind direction can affect the bite and the catch. And, and uh, the worst direction for fishing there, for my experience, is if it's blowing from the south or the southwest. Usually if it blows from the I would not. I'm not spending time to drive all the way up there. Uh, here is an excellent slide from from the site FOS, F -O -S .is. It marks like the genuine or general fishing spots in the lake. And uh, it's a really nice uh, site, FOS.is. It's, uh, it's like the phone book of, of Angler here in Iceland. So there's so much information in there. All in Icelandic, of course, but uh, still for us, Icelandic is excellent. An excellent site. So we start uh, this area here, is the first one we are going to have a look at. Then we are going to have a look at this here, and then this here, and then we are going to move to the end of the field. And we start here in uh, where the Thorsá river or the stream runs into the lagoon. And early season, I would say th these are the really good spots here, even on the other side here. You can fish actually all the spots in the lava area, and you will go, go into that on the next slide. Uh, you can find fish here in this uh, tiny little, little bay here called Budavik. And uh, some, it's uh, often e it's easy to spook them here, but you can try to sneak in with your tri fly. It can can get really funny. Uh, all the spots, the red spots here are that I marked in is spots that I personally caught fish on. I keep my own fishing diary and it's pretty accurate. So uh, I've, yeah, I've been fishing in transfer for now <clears throat> about ten years. And it is uh, based on my experience in the early season. And the locals say the season starts in the lava field, definitely. And here is the other part of the lava field. And you can see all the all the red spots. There are like so many good places here and uh, one very important thing to have in keep in mind is that uh, you have to uh, finish your drag when you cast out. You have to finish your drag all the way to your waders so or to your toes because you may you may have fish just following your fly without even recognizing it. I got a lots of lots of takes on the on the just right just a rod length away from me. And you can do like we say you can do all the hike here. It's quite a hike. With your rod, and it's like there should be plenty of space for everybody. And this tiny, tiny bay here, you can, you can fish as well. And from, yes, it all depends on how you, how, how long you want to walk. Easiest way is to park your car here, but we often hike down here, and then you reach this side of the, of the lava. It's a very popular, popular spot. Uh, then to the fence or to the garden here. Uh, this is also a very good spot. This depends though more like on the water level. If the water level is low, especially like in yeah, June, July, and August, if, if it's too low water level this, uh, this place is kind of dead. Uh, you will not catch uh, any after char there. This is, a, this is the dam I'm speaking about. So you can fish like here, 20 meters close to the dam this side, and 100, 100 meters this side. And this land here is in a private property, so that's, what, that's basically the reason. You can catch fish in this part, but I will 
Countdown the Others, like I told you. Uh, before. Uh, I and my kids, we've done good fishing here from this tiny coast in like May. And uh, they caught like three fishes, my kids, just with a like a children rod and a spinner on it. But I was still just in the car here preparing for, you know, for action. But that's how it is. And there were some angl <laughs> anglers around here that uh, my kids kind of squeezed in between and through their through their uh, spinners and can't caught a fish while the others hadn't have, have, didn't catch anything. So they were not amused with my children. They were <laughs> not giving me a not giving me a friendly eye when I checked on my kids. But that's how it is. Sometimes you are lucky. Sometimes you're, you're not fishing anything at all. You're catching anything. Uh, then to the end of the fjord, when it comes into the season, like in yeah, the beginning beginning of August, uh, you will see the fish kind of spreads then and gets closer. It gets more spread all over the lake, and uh, in August you can start to uh, check on those spots. Those spots you, you can try them in the early season, but I've never caught anything uh, like remarkably anything here in like in. May, or April. So this is like a later season thing, and uh, this is like the south end. Uh, this is like a shallow water here, and you can wait actually over here, fish from the rocks here and from this coast and hike all the way up here. All depends on uh, what you want. But uh, when you're doing waiting in here, you should be kind of uh, careful because there are some pits just where the river runs into the lake. I once caught myself totally stuck in here and it was the fortune I was not alone fishing. So Inki, my fishing partner, had to help me to get my leg out. So uh, please be careful at that spot. But that's the only spot in the lake that I had ever any troubles at uh, while I was waiting in and fishing. Sometimes you can see schools of fish here. Sometimes you spook them and it just all depends. You know. uh, it's all about the finding the fish in Rensfjord. You have to find about the fish. Sometimes uh, if you don't see the fish uh, or any life and you don't get, get any bite, you have to be kind of mobile, you have to move and kind of scan the area systematically. Uh, here in the corner here, I and Inky, my friend, we caught like one, one time 40, I'm not kidding, over 40 fishes, 40, just in one, in a matter of hour here. But uh, all, all on the same fly, which I call Kaldrafluan, and I'm, I'm gonna place a video about Kaldrafluan when I get material for it. But uh, it is totally still weather, just like a mirror, and you are just there, catching all the fish we wanted. But suddenly, there was a little bit, just tiny, just a meter to three or a second of, of wind, and then this school of fish simply moved and just vanished. So that's how the uh, how the wind can affect the uh, the catching in the lagoon. The transfer. Um, now, if, since we have been through the history and uh, geology, we are going to like uh, have a look at the biology of the lake and have a look at the ecosystem, uh, what we have here, and uh, this is the most common catch, such as fish here, which is the arctic char. And this is like a dominant species in the lake, definitely. It's sought after by anglers, since it's an excellent fish to eat. And there is also, by and by, you can find Atlantic salmon in there, and you can find sea trout as well. But it's kind of odd to catch one of those two. 90% uh, of your catch is, uh, is the Arctic char. Uh, the, uh, yeah, I've caught eel in this lake. Not, not me, but a friend of mine. And not on a fly, but on a bait. And it's uh, not often caught there. And there is flounder in the lake. And they will grow actually up to this size and even even bigger, a little bit bigger, it will grow up to full size. And uh, 
it's a very so popular it is among anglers to catch one. Uh, I have not heard about if there is like a local Arctic char in the lake. I think it is only like a Siren one. And I only heard like one story about rainbow trout in that lake, but rainbow trout is not natural species in Iceland. So um, if you catch a rainbow in Iceland, like the nature, that's definitely a fish that escaped from some fish farms. And it has then uh, stickle sticklebacks in the lake. Not many of them, but uh, you can use like flies that imitate imitate something something like like that, or tiny like a minnow or, or something. It imitates like a little fish, and it's going to work fine for the Arctic char as well. Here is a fish that I caught a few years back. There, this is like a four pounder. It's a this is a sea trout. It's just like it's a fat sea trout in great conditions. It's the first fish of the season. I caught there in June, early June, and it has this uh, fly vegetation in its mouth. And I will make a video on vegetation soon, sooner than later. And uh, here is a picture from the dam. It's actually from a tour I'm, I was making. It's not fishing, any any fishing related. It's way too too late in the season. You see, there's like frost, clear snow, and a tiny ice on the on the lake. But these are tourists I put brought there, and uh, I have a story there for you. Uh, I was with tourists here in September in 2008, late September, and I was guiding people from uh, Tampa in Florida. It's a group of eight people, and they were doing like a photo, you know, uh, photograph uh, school, school about photography. So uh, I decided to have a look to take a walk out on the out on the dam here and have a look and just in a few seconds what I saw was a humongous sea trout just lurking here not that deep you will see it it was just swimming back and forth probably waiting for some something to eat coming in with a tide and it was not less than 90 centimeters it was close to a meter long so it was absolutely monster sea trout for this lake i never seen any fish so big in this lake before or after. And there was a guy from Florida who saw, saw it with me. So I have witnesses here, if you do not uh, believe me. It was more like a tuna or, or, or something. It was amazing how, how big it was. And this, uh, to catch one on this, of this size in the lake, there is a, the chance is so slim. But it's true what I'm telling you, guys. Uh, we do have uh, the area, as you see, it's beautiful and it's still, there's Inki, my fishing partner, and during the night it's very pretty as well. Uh, we have a loon on the lake, and we have uh, swans, we have ducks, and we have even uh, white-tailed eagles sometimes in the uh, area. And the area itself is just breathtaking, it's so, so pretty. Uh, yeah, next slide, that's the uh, flounder thing. There is actually, uh, close to the dam and that area, there is pl plenty of flounder in the lake and uh, it reaches full size and some anglers, uh, some anglers uh, are, are not fond of the flounder and they look at it, some, look at it as an intruder to the Icelandic nature since it's uh, not been here for Probably, probably less than 20 years, 15, 20 years or, or about. But um, yeah, so the flounder is kind of like a new species in the Icelandic waters. But um, I'll have a, I have another story for, for you, a funny, funny story actually. I was uh, fishing by the, by the, not by the dam, but by the carpet behind the dam. And there were three guys there fishing and I decided to go on the side of them so I'd not squeeze myself in between their spots. And in a matter of five uh, minutes, I caught, I caught a bite and I landed the fish. So uh, two of the guys just left when I <laughs> landed, landed that fish and uh, 
had were kind of pissed off. And after only 15 minutes, uh, I caught one another and, and one another. So I had three fishes uh, just in a matter of about 15 20 minutes. So the last guy who was there walked to me and asked me what flies I was uh, using, and I showed him my uh, box and showed him the fly I had on, which is called Inkefluan, and there is a video on Inkefluan in, on my channel. And I actually gave him one of his uh, Inkefluan flies, and he was very much uh, happy about that. And this was like in late June, it was sunshine and relatively warm for Icelandic uh, conditions. And this wife uh, from this guy who I gave the flies, he was just by the car tanning and uh, also she was actually only on a bikini on a relatively cold day, you know, still quite cold in Iceland, so uh, it's kind of funny. She was, yeah, light, lightly dressed and good looking by the car. Uh, finally, after like half an hour, 45 minutes of nothing happening, finally that guy got a bite, just finally, and he yelled at his woman to bring him the landing net and he was uh, not speaking Icelandic or English, I think he was uh, from Poland or some, it was an uh, Eastern European country or language, so uh, he yelled at, her, yelled at her, at his wife to bring the landing net and so did his uh, faithful wife, she ran on the bikini with uh, the landing net uh, to him and passed him the landing net and uh, it was a relatively big fish according to the bend of the rod but suddenly the man realized that he had a huge flounder on his hook not an arctic char he was not amused so he yelled at the <laughs> at this woman to pack everything just pack everything and leave he was not amused at all it was really funny and he threw the passion, threw the fish back in the lake, frustrated within about two minutes. And <laughs> yeah, within about two minutes, I was standing on the beach alone and they were just gone. It was really funny. And uh, telling the story in Icelandic, it's even more funny to listen to. But uh, they were not amused of the, of the flounder catch they caught. <laughs> but the flounder can, it's an excellent fish to eat. So. It just varies on how, how much anglers here in Iceland still appreciate that uh, fish. So, uh, this slide is about the uh, ecosystem and it's about uh, the food of the fish. It's just like a basic, uh, just like a basic um, slide on it. Uh, we have those marflows or the uh, skirts or the tiny shrimps. We have sticklebacks, we have pupas and larvas, and we have flies, uh, some different kinds of flies, and this is just based on what I've seen coming from a fish uh, that I've caught in the lake. And some gnats and midges are really strong, like those uh, tight in the size of 14 or, or 16. And most of the catch I've ever caught in transfer is uh, on a fly called Dagbjörd. We have a video on that uh, fly on the channel as well. And you can use streamers here, like to imitate the sticklebacks. And sometimes uh, you can also use like dry flies, and it all just depends on uh, depends on uh, what you have and uh, how how the conditions and the and part of the season you are fishing in. Uh, where to fish and what flies to pick for Hrensfjörður. This is just a slide I made. Those are pictures actually from the force.is web, web page by Christian. And here's another picture from myself. And this is a fly here called Dagbjörd. And you see the mats. This is the size of them. This is just really tiny midges I'm tying. And those are the ones that gave me the best results in transfer, like way be beyond better catch than anything else. Uh, this slide is like uh, the flies you could take there and be absolutely safe and sound with. Um, Longskekkur by Örn Jólmarsson 
is I believe the most popular fly in in um, transferer and it's uh, kind of easy to get uh, good cats on it. It's either Langskeggur or this one here, Krokur. And we have both of those videos on the on the channel. My personal preference would be Dagbjört. With or without legs. Hertis is a really strong fly in Hansfjörður. And some pupas like Bab or Kippi, like this one. And then Almarun, which we just uh, recently posted a video on the channel about. With these six flies you, you, for the Arctic chair, you should be absolutely solid. But in harsh conditions, like not harsh, but really difficult conditions, uh, Taupjört tied just this slim on a slim hook with or without legs is often the answer to, to some cats. Uh, here are some cats I caught back in the days before I was uh, doing cats and release. I do much more of the cats and release stuff today. But you can see how, how big those fishes are, and uh, today I would, I would not be killing all of them. I've learned a lot as an angler, so I would be taking maybe a couple of fish back home and we will be really releasing, releasing the rest of them to the, back to the lake. Simply because, you know, we, we have a saying here in Iceland, that fish does not spawn. It will not spawn when it's dead, so for... Uh, Recre recreation, recre recreating the and keeping the stock, you need to, of course, release something when you have to think about the nature in that uh, way. Actually, all of those Arctic charts were fished and caught on the uh, Dagbjörn fly. Uh, here, are, here is another slide. You can pause this slide if you like. Uh, I'm not going to I read all the flies, but there are some streamers and wet flies and nymphs and stuff. But uh, on this, these flies, I've caught fish on all of them in Transfigure. So I can just, just skip that slide and you can pause that slide and have a, have a better look. All of those flies are on the channel in the video, except this one here, and it's coming soon. Uh, the setup, the gear rod and the line setup for Hrensfjörður, that is something I wanted to talk about. Uh, the line weight there and the rod weight, I will be fishing with a rod number. It's uh, 5 is my favorite uh, pick, but often, often in Iceland you have wind, so rod or line weight number 5 will not do, so 6, even 7 if it's windy and down to three or four if it's like uh, totally still weather and if you're playing around with a dry fly. Uh, you'll be using a floating line, you don't need a sink, sinking line in transfer and if you want to fish deeper you just use a longer liter and tippet and uh, weighted flies. And some people prefer to fish with strike indicators in transfer, I do not uh, fish in still water with strike, strike indicators and it's just my preferences and uh, the drag when you're reeling in or, or dragging in the fly uh, I would say the names and the pupas you should drag rather slowly and you can strip the streamers fast to attract the fish and get the fish to uh, attack uh, dry flies in Hrensfjörður, that's an another opportunity I wanted to, to mention, but uh, uh, the, oh, oh, you all know this fly, Griffith's net, but uh, a really, really strong, really seriously <laughs> strong fly in Hrensfjörður. Uh, black net, tight as a dry fly, and Europa are as well an ex excellent dry patterns in Hrensfjörður. So, now I'm gonna show you some pictures from Transfer. This is myself, me myself, fishing in the lava field. And you can see there is fish uh, rising here, 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 here in front of me, and all over the place. Sometimes it's just really boiling of fish. It's really fun to fish there. Uh, <coughs> yeah, this is a fish that my son, it's not me, this is my son. 
he caught this by hand actually <laughs> the uh, stream that runs into the into the like he was very proud of it until he found out it was not gonna survive but uh, yeah those are the kids it's funny uh, eagles you can see eagles here sometimes by and by and I believe there is like a nest or something because I've seen eagles so often in Transfer. This is Transfer at the springtime, like uh, early June. And uh, here are some cats. This is just from uh, 2019. And this is a cat from Inki from one day in Transfer. This Inki is my student kind of uh, both in fishing and fly tying and today he, he catches all on his own and he's teaching his son to to fly fish so passing on the knowledge there's a it's not from transfer but definitely the best fishing picture that that's, has ever been taken of me taken by my friend david Wilmetarson from the law school here is Inki in the uh, lava field, fishing, looking for fish. Here is Inki again, and you can see, you can actually, all around here, you can have fish just right by the shore. You just need to see it, and uh, if you see it from ripples on the water, just cast a light fly on it and, and try your luck. Here is Inki, working on the cast. And here is me and Axel, my son, it's another cat. Here is Bjarki, my older son. And this day we caught four fishes in the lava field. It's like a popular spot and it's like a hot spot, kind of, you know, everybody wants to fish the lava. It's like a popular spot and for a really good reason. Here's me. And you can see the garden here, the fence and some car parts over and some people fishing here as well. This is uh, in June and I've caught some, caught some fish. It can be really, really fun, much fun to fish there. Here it is during the like 9 p.m. in the evening in June while it's daylight all, all night long. It's so beautiful, impressive. And here, same, same night some car parts on the other side. People actually come here and, and park and stay the night, a couple of nights or even a weekend and for fishing. Here is some cats uh, from evening, just just an evening catch and this is all caught on the same dry fly, Griffith's net. It's a really, really seriously strong fly in transfer. Here is Inky. There are some fish here here, 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 and here, and close by, but at that point they were not biting and we already caught something, so we were just playing around trying to see if we would catch anything, but well, on this side on the lake we didn't. And at midnight, this is how Rensville can look. It's really pretty in the area. Highly recommend it. So, uh, possible changes in the last uh, 20 or 30 years, and maybe in the coming future. The tides control the amount in the lagoon, and so does the weather. Rain, and snow and stuff, so it kind of varies and depends on the, that thing. And that will, of course, uh, the water level in the uh, lagoon will affect the fishing. If there is too high water, that can be a trouble, problem. And if there is uh, low water, sorry, low water in the uh, lagoon, that can be a problem as well because then the fish is not by the coast; it's just out in the out on the lake in the middle where it's colder. And um, since I started fishing transferred, there is a little bit less of Arctic char, so uh, I would say people should really think about before they go there and kill 10, 15, 20 fishes. I mean. This sport is, it is a sport, this uh, fly fishing and fishing. It's uh, not about uh, killing everything that you can catch. That's from my opinion. Flounder in the lake, if that affects the uh, 
the Arctic char. Some people say yes, it eats the eggs from the Arctic char, but I don't know if it uh, if it's like like a serious on, on the scale. It's getting serious. And natural fluctuations like temperature and its effect, like effects like that. Uh, there is less Arctic char, and it's uh, happening in some other parts of Iceland too. And this natural fluctuations uh, has to also to do with the food uh, that the fish has if it goes to the ocean to eat, and the food variety there. So it, yeah, nature plays a big, big role. Uh, Rensjörður, you can fish in Rensjörður by going to the website www.vedekortet.is and uh, buy the fishing cart. And as I said, this is a uh, you can buy the fishing cart if you're. It's like a, for non-resident people as well, so same price for both. So top in quality. Uh, so I guess uh, we are done with Transferer uh, uh, lecture about Transferer. There's a friend of mine fishing in the uh, in the lava. I just want to say remember to like, share, and subscribe to the channel because we are going to make more of this content as well. And uh, here is the references, if you want to have a look at them, those are the main references uh, that I uh, used during uh, in making, this, uh, making this lecture. And here's my contact info, fluidsmeana.gmail.com, so just feel free and contact me if you have any, any questions or complaints. So I just want to say to you guys, thank for watching. Remember to like, share and subscribe to the channel and I will see you guys in the next video.